All right. So thank you all for joining. Uh, last week, I believe we concluded on um, what are we working on, which is a fairly big topic. Um, and we, I believe Chris brought up the point of trying to document what it is that we're working on in the, uh, in the Google Doc that we have. Um, I will share that link um, just so everyone has it in the chat window. And then I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So uh, we also have to go through the rest of this doc here and kind of um, clean it up a little bit. But what are we working on is kind of a big topic. I, I went to just go look at what OWASP actually had to say. And I was actually kind of surprised about one uh, thing. Um, there was no mention of use cases. In dun, dun, the OWASP. Dun. Yeah, which was really interesting. Um, I, I just kind of realized that today. So what it is that we're working on, what kinds of things, technology, use cases, processes, what kinds of things do we want to be able to describe with what are we working on? Well, I can, once again, everything I do is colored from the medical device you know, domain. So let me just start with that. But <clears throat> for FDA, we do two types of threat modeling, one of which is what's typically called asset threat modeling of the topology of the system, as well as any custom hardware, the interior components, no regard to abstraction levels. Mm -hmm. And that's the most, that's by far the most useful for design time to figure out where we need to put our efforts inside of the system and inside of the device resulting yep. in things like hardware changes and stuff like that. They can even come out of that. Uh, and then for check the box activities for the FDA, we have to do process threat modeling, which uh, on, uh, what is it, six different areas, uh, uh, supply chain, uh, deployment, decommissioning, field updates, those kind of things, which we do attack trees with because they're just about worthless real close to being worthless, but we have to check the box for the FDA. Um, so we do these and try not to waste too much time on that. So we go from one asset threat modeling that is incredibly impactful to the projects to these others that are check the box activities. Okay, got it. So you have different types of components. You have processes, which could be a technical process or a business process. Yeah. And they're, they're not really technical. They're, they're business processes. I mean, yes, they're technical and okay. how they're accomplished, but um, I mean, you know, even supply process. chain. Right. It's more business process than anything. And for yeah. asset threat modeling, we just use Stride to decompose the system. And, uh, and you use stride for a taxonomy or as a methodology? As, as a methodology, we go through and define the whole thing up front. One of the things I really like about the approach is unlike all other forms of threat modeling, which is open-ended, you never know when you're done. You never know what your level of completion is and what you've missed. And you go, gosh, I put so much time into this. It must be complete, right? No, you never know. Yeah. And the thing I like about Stride is there you can define your topology and all of your hardware, and that is your that's your guardrails. It automatically then says, here are your potential vulnerabilities that you need to explore. Let me go through and look at those vulnerabilities and score them accordingly. So it's it's a nice constrained bounded method for threat modeling. How do you uh, how do you apply that with your process threat modeling? We don't, they don't cross mingle at all. Um, they're, they're literally, they're in the same report to the FDA. That's about it. 
Right. Okay. We also and we also the, include in there for the FDA what are called security architecture reviews, which are nothing more than how the manufacturer is communicating to the FDA reviewer what your system is and what type type of assets you're using and how you're doing things like authentication, authorization, encryption. Is that kind of like an attestation system. type of thing? It's it's more of a communication type of thing where the reviewer gets this submission package and he doesn't know if it's a you know continuous glucose monitor, little tiny runs on a 22 milliamp hour battery device that's disposable and a phone app, or if it's a proton accelerator, which is two stories of equipment and hundreds of computers. So you're conveying to the reviewer, here's my system and here's what the interrelationship between all these pieces looks like. So the reviewer, it's one of the first things the reviewer is going to go to when he gets this submission. So he's going to pull this out and look at it and go, oh, now I understand what I'm dealing with. All right. Now I can start to, as I start to dive in and tunnel into all the rest of the artifacts, documents, uh, I can now ask fairly salient questions about it. So it's, it's, it's a great opportunity. So all that goes together into one report, process threat modeling, asset threat modeling, and security architecture views all go to the same report for the FDA and they look at it and they're kind of similar. I mean, we reuse a lot of topology, for instance, out of asset threat modeling and security architecture views. Okay. And just out of interest, the, the format of that report, is that defined by the FDA or is it kind of every device manufacturer does what they like and the FDA just says yay or nay to what you've provided? To a certain degree. Uh, there's actually 14 artifacts. Uh, sorry, I should just say I'm using medical device jargon. 14 documents that are PDFs that you attach to the FDA on on a electronic submission package. It's actually a, it's actually a dynamic PDF itself that you attach things to, but that's how you submit it. And previously, when it was in decades past, it was all paper based. And however you wanted to format and deliver it, all this content was totally up to the manufacturer. And it was just the Wild West. As you can imagine, that must have been a nightmare for the reviewers because every submission was different. And so it was very difficult for them. Now they've constrained you with the electronic submissions. And now they define, here are the 14 documents we want to see. Here's the content we want to see in each one of them. In some cases, they go down to, here are the sections we want to see in each one of those. For instance, uh, cryptographic controls. Uh, they go into how do you do authentication? How do you do authorization? How do you do cryptography? How do you do data integrity? You know, bump, 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 down the line. So much so that when you submit it, you actually have to tell them the page numbers of where each of these sections are. So it varies. Now, in this particular one for threat modeling, they don't go into specific sections, but they do tell you the content they want in each one. Yes. Hmm. I could show you a lovely graphic of it that you would hate, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> It, it was difficult for everybody. So I literally made a graphic of this is what it looks like. Big tree diagram. And I'm, I'm conscious yeah. also that, you know, I think part of the objectives here with, with this format is that it we do need to, or let's say maybe, I don't know if it's a hard requirement, but it would be nice that there's interoper interoperability with the SBOM functionality, right? So what you've got in the SBOM and what you've got in the TM bomb those two things aren't just two separate things that happen to be kind of, you know, both bombs, but they, they can work together synergistically so that the information in one can also be used as information with other. Is the kind of the process threat modeling, is is that mappable to bomb stuff, uh, S-bomb stuff? So uh, for for the asset threat modeling, it's, it's really just another type of component. Uh, we already have services defined, right? It's just another type of component. Um, for process, we don't have a generic way to represent a process today. We do have existing process capabilities in the spec. For example, formulation, which describes the, pro the technical process of how something was actually built, right? How software was built, how co cookies were made, you know, whatever you want to describe. That is a kind of process, but we don't have like a general way outside of formulation. We don't have a general way to describe like a business process. So that's that's something that needs mm. to be added. Wait, I, I have to, to, to make a distinction here. 
are we talking about business processes and computing processes or because I, I don't see business processes at least at, at this stage of, of things coming and taking place here but computing processes definitely yes yeah right now we don't support either um, but a computing so... process is an asset so you could support it that on a stride model yes it, it would be on any model uh, uh it, it's important for me here that yeah we think in terms of the components and the output of a threat model but leave the methodology completely out of it mm -hmm. yeah. if if we start hanging on which methodology we're going to use it and including that as part of the format there will be no win discussions and i don't think yeah. we're going to achieve anything with that yeah, on the exactly. other hand, if we take if we take the approach of you know what, DFD three, where a circle is a process, a rectangle is an asset. Now, if at this time the 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 standard cannot accommodate a process as a process, then I would suggest we put a process as an asset and treat it that way. The yeah. connection with the ESPO, I think that uh, Stephen was uh, alluding to, and Stephen, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong is that use case that we discussed two weeks ago, where at the SBOM, when a vulnerability is found in a package that is registered to an asset, then the threat model can inform what's the criticality of that asset from the threat model point of view. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right? So that's that's a big one for me. And I, I really think that at this time, the solution would be to relate to processes as assets. So that you, you could, for example, come and declare that a given uh, uh, a microservice is an asset. Yeah. And yeah, that it you can has do dependencies, that. and then you can play with that back and forth. Yep. But, yep. but the methodology itself, I would say, let's steer clear out of that. I agree. I agree. Um, I, 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 he's all right. Um, literally, as the guy who wrote the book on this and who I had sitting over here, I hate to contradict you. <laughs> let, let me push back. <laughs> I'm, I'm I totally open term... to being contradicted. <laughs> well, I wrote my own book, so I, I, I we can hold the books, right? Um, but um, I, I, one of the things that always bothers me is overloading language. And uh, I think assets should remain what assets are. And let's talk about process threat modeling as a service. So you have you know pure software threat modeling where you have services that are there and you're doing that, I think we should call it what it is. Otherwise, it might get confusing to people. But I think we should talk about what the relationships are between this. So as opposed to saying, uh, you, you referenced data flow diagram three, and it's like, instead of even saying, this is a circle, this is a square, saying, I have this process, and it's a software process, and it's now, but here's the relationship to these other processes. And maybe if that's the what standard can about. accommodate it totally. If the standard can accommodate, I completely agree with you, right? I think this, I if, think the standard can because we haven't defined it yet. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean the 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 S bomb standard, like on, on top oh, of what Steve okay. said. I mean, at, at our level, I'm totally there with you. We have to be as discriminant, I think, is the word as possible, so that mm -hmm. we we achieve clarity. If if we start mixing things, as you said. It's a road to hell, but yeah. we have to be cognizant that this has to translate to something that can be meshed with the existing uh, standard. Now, if we have a translation layer in the middle, hey, I'm all for it, right? But uh, if we don't and we have to accommodate what exists today, then I think that simplifications will have to be made. Now, I'm going to throw over... Um... This is a uh, this is the Versprite product uh, fork, and I just wanted to bring this up because um, the very first step of this whole thing is really defining what the objectives are and the use cases, um, which is something that most threat modeling tools that I've seen anyway really don't support but i think it's important to in my opinion start capturing some of this information because again these use cases can be used you know to 
ident to help you identify what's going to be in and out of scope for a particular stakeholder. It could be used for other things, such as the attestation uh, support in Cyclone DX. So what are we working on? In my opinion, should also include the use cases that are, you know, that this asset and business process are supporting. Uh, could you give an, an example, Steve? Um, as a user, I want to authenticate and get um, uh, customized stock quotes um, for the RSUs that I have in my portfolio. So with that, you know that you know you're going to have publicly identifiable financial information. You're going to have personally identifiable financial information. You're going to have credentials, right? So you're going to know a little bit more context on what it is that the diagram is trying to represent. And without that context, I think, you know, it's, it's really, imp it's going to be really difficult for a consumer of that threat model to kind of understand why you came up with certain threats. But Steve, the, the, the question here is where you begin, because if you have a design, it's fair to assume that the design has already been influenced by the use cases. You don't just design something and then you throw use cases at it. You usually go the other way around. So right. that design by itself will already incorporate the, the architecture necessary to fulfill the use cases. What we do need is, is a level of enrichment on the elements that we identify that will say, okay, this thing has PII, this thing has financial information, this thing has this, this thing has that. Right? Perhaps a separate pros, big thing that describes the, the system and incorporates those use cases that definitely has, place in, has a place in there. Yeah. But uh, I'm 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 worried about throwing the sink into the, the the format, everything in the sink, and and ending up with a lot of fields that either won't be consumed by something or won't be useful down the road. I mean, I don't think that we want to use the standard to replace all the possible kinds of documentation for the system. We we want something here that that's going to have like use especially in automation but uh the system documentation will still exist it's yeah i was I, I was more you know if you if you have a use case so i the way i was going about it was well if you have a use case then you can start documenting the abuse cases uh which the abuse cases would be really really applicable to what it is that we're trying to build but then again, that goes to methodology. Some people do threat modeling by abuse cases. Some people use stride. For each one of them, you're going to, to end up asking for a different set of initial information. Are we going to throw every single possible starting set of, of details into the thing in the hope that somebody is going to use it? We have to, to mm -hmm. make sure if we are separating a methodology to, to not fall into the trap of just adding stuff in there because somebody eventually may use it. But I think that kind of goes to the, you know, what, what are the required elements and what are the optional ones, right? I have a need at my employer to document abuse cases. We don't practice any kind of methodology. I could care less about the methodology personally, mm -hmm. but we do have to, we, we do have to describe abuse cases. So you use um, a methodology, you use an abuse case as a methodology. <laughs> we 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 have a we have our own little methodology because uh -huh. service now is kind of a snowflake. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's unique. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, so so, but... you, uh, so Steve, Steve, you're you're suggesting both use cases and abuse cases as part of the format, or just as an cases? optional thing. You know, I, again, I don't want to be. Um, you know, I don't want to be overly prescriptive in terms of, oh, well, 
here, here's a bunch of assets and you have to follow the stride model, right? I, I, I don't want to do that. Um, I do want to have assets. I do want to have data flows. I do want to have processes, right? These are very basic things, basic building blocks. Um, and I believe use cases and abuse cases are, a use case mm -hmm. is, a, is a basic building block. And there's a lot of things that you can do with these building blocks later on down the road if you have them. And these, so they they establish, um, well, certainly the use case is kind of establish the context of the model. Right. They help you understand what what the the what are we working on, the the what are we what you're building, kind of. Question. Why does this thing exist the way it does, right? Well, yeah. and where, where I see it most useful and where we use it all the time is after we do asset threat modeling, this gives you a list of potential vulnerabilities. And I say that because there's about a 30% false positive on the, that list because of the abstract nature of threat modeling. But then we order that by looking at severity and exploitability and scoring each one of those potential vulnerabilities that came out of that. And we do that in light of the use case. So let me give you an example, real world. You've got an automatic external defibrillator, an, a, an, a, an AFD, uh, sitting on the wall, like at an airport, okay? It's sitting there broadcasting out with Bluetooth low energy uh, advertising packets that uh, have the battery level currently inside that thing, okay? So service guys can walk by and go, oh, yeah, it's fully charged. Okay, we're good. I move on. Do you care about authentication, authorization, integrity, encryption, any of that? Nope, you don't care about any of that. If the, the service guy walks by and he doesn't see anything coming from it, he goes, oh, wait a minute, I got a problem. He goes over and checks it out, right? I mean, that's literally what we're talking about. But if I use that same topology, and it's going to look the same on that asset threat model, but use that same topology to now have a Bluetooth low energy connection because my use case has changed and I now have bi-directional communications going across it. Mm -hmm. And I can affect the amount of energy delivered on a shocking event. I can trigger a shocking event. And pull up patient information from it okay all of a sudden now i now care about authentication authorization encryption integrity checking all of that suddenly plays into it but for that i just need to know in my architecture that i have a a, a dual way on the on the bluetooth communication i don't yeah, have it, it, it on it's, the data it's, flow. It, it's not just as simple as bi-directional communication it is what is the nature of that bi-directional communication right but i i, I don't have to have a post-it on my screen all the time reminding me that that thing is getting information that's going to turn the thing on or off or do some damage to the hardware. I know that I have an incoming channel through that thing, and I know yeah. that it's important to me, so I need to have authentication. My point is that the use case informs the architecture to the point that you end up with an architecture that describes the thing that you are working on, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. I don't have to have that you, the list of use cases at all times in front of my face to always remind me of the bad things that can happen to the architecture. So while I see the value of the use cases, I like the way that Steve put it as an optional. And, you know, inside the optional field, hey, whatever you want to put in there, if that's good for you, put it in, in there, right? Because mm -hmm. it's going to inform the way that you're going to use the bomb at the end of the day. But to put that as something that needs to be in the bomb for the bomb to be complete, in my opinion, is forcing people to go more steps than they actually need to get something good out of it. Well, this kind of gets back to the last meeting where I brought up model-based systems engineering. And, uh, and you're, you're right, these are, that is, there's a lot of information that goes into that. We have all the activity diagrams, all the sequence diagrams, timing, physical parts of it, logical parts of it. I mean, there's a lot of activity that goes into it. You do have one model though that knows everything about the system and could therefore automate threat modeling out of it. But mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a garbage in garbage out situation, right? As much information as we put in into what I'm calling out the bomb, we will eventually enable a very good tool to create a better threat model. But my point is that there is a minimal set of information that will create any and that will help any tool to create some threat model that can be a beginning. And I wouldn't want to shoot for the maximal case when we haven't even settled the 
the, the, the smallest set that can be used. Fair point. The, um, the, these are, these are abstract. These are not concrete type of things. Um, but, uh, we have basically a, a bunch of different abstract types of component types today. We have applications, frameworks, libraries, containers, platforms, operating system device, device drivers, firmware files, ML models, data, and cryptographic asset. We also have services. Now, these are the types of components that we that we currently have um and then again of course we have services um one thing that's obviously missing in this list is is some kind of process right or a i don't think the process is yeah I, I don't think process is a kind of component it's something else but it, it's it's missing so that that needs to be there um so for reference, I'm just going to put this in the um, um, okay. Uh, that way, you kind of have a reference to the to the uh, component types that we that we currently support. Um, so what are we working on? So um, we need to be able to describe the things, right? And if those things are assets then those things have to be there fair statement or requirement yeah so if threat modeling assets then those assets are required I cannot spell today. I'm also, <laughs> I'm also dyslexic as hell. So, um, all right. If threat modeling assets, then those assets are required. The same. If we do, again, this is you know minimal viable first. But if we get down to the, if we do process threat modeling, then those processes are required. Right. Again, not being prescriptive but giving folks flexibility in trying to document whatever it is that they're trying to accomplish. Um, now, if you are describing assets and you're doing asset threat modeling, typically diagrams are used. If you're doing process threat modeling, Diagrams are used. So diagrams I kind of see as a common thing, no matter what kind of threat modeling is, is being performed. Fair statement? They're all no. purely textual. They're all purely textual approaches where the output is actually a diagram, but the input is actually textual. I'm not a fan of those, but right. Wait, wait, wait. Run that by me again. Sorry, I, I, I had to, to answer someone on Slack. Um, in both in both approaches, if you're doing asset threat modeling or process threat modeling, typically diagrams can be used in both of those approaches. Diagrams are a nice to have. Yes. They, so they, optional. They are, they are totally optional. I mean. It's Diagrams one of the big are... things that I had with uh, OTM in the beginning. OTM requires X, Y coordinates for elements. Right. Sure, why not? But I don't have X, Y. So mm -hmm. what? Do I have to exactly. put minus one in there? So he's Yeah, our, that's our, what we do. Our, are you opposed to the location, the X, Y coordinate, in other words, of the, of the diagram? 
or the I'm, diagram I'm, the diagram elements themselves. I'm opposed to the fact that requiring an XY location implies that you already have a laid out diagram. I, I have had teams in the past, for example, that would say we don't want to track model because we don't have the time to do diagrams. As much as I think that it was a weak answer. Because if you can diagram the thing that you are building, then you have bigger problems than not having a threat model. Still, so, it's what's about so, it's, so getting back to what you said about DFD3, if we just had DFD3 elements and, and no talk about how they're located, what they're doing, and the relationship between those elements, is that common to everything? In my view, and, and I will totally accept being told that I'm wrong, I think that that's the minimum set of details that you need on any given system, saying which ones are the elements, what the data flows between them, and perhaps the trust boundaries. But I, I would posit that that's enough for starting a, a fair threat model. So, so it's a fairly strong statement that then we're, we're, we're saying uh, that you do not have a threat model if you do not have a diagram. And, I, I wouldn't say that. Right. So you can have a threat model even though you don't have a diagram. In yes. my opinion, yes. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, yeah. take, take what people are doing today with LLMs, right? They, they are writing descriptions yep. and getting textual. Yeah. Uh, there's no diagramming involved. Right. But let's let. But they're but they're still describing the same elements that would be in a diagram. They're just well. Not at, at some point, you have to describe your system, right? Right, right. So there's processes and there's things like that that are going to go yeah. and flows. And yeah, so those are all going to be there. So, But nobody's Whether putting it's... out a pen and a napkin and saying, wait, 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 wait. First, I have to diagram this thing. It's, it's perfectly fine to start and finish without a diagram. And, and, and I say that even that is a bit of a cheat because I'm quite sure that whomever is doing that descrip uh, description, in their head, they have something that's very much like a diagram. But that's neither here nor there. Yeah, we do a lot of automation at my employer and, um, you know, based on existing data, we can, um, we can start identifying potential threats just from data and yeah, there's, there's no diagrams. So, um, yeah, with the big focus on automation, because diagrams, in my opinion, kind of hinder that a lot. Yeah. Because uh, yep. it's, I mean, unless you throw it to a throw it to an AI, you know, it's a manual effort in a lot of cases. Yep. Yep. But and a lot of the common. existing documentation on on not diagrams, a lot of the existing design documentation is text. Is you know, this is what we are trying to build, and this PRDs. is how we're going to build it. Yeah. Right. Right. Yep. Right. Good. Okay. All right. So let me just get on the record. Yeah, I agree with what everybody just said. That being said, I hate those approaches. I hate those <laughs> because if you've ever seen how people write requirements, they don't know how to do that. And English is too flexible. And so when you run on with this prose and you've got multiple things in the statement and you're, oh, it's, it's I hate it, I hate it. So, but yeah, I recognize it's a thing. And we've already mentioned that use cases, abuse cases, these are gonna be optional. Um, and let's see. So uh, let, let me push back on that, Steve. Use cases, uh, great, optional, I think that's good. What is the value of abuse cases being? Is this just show the mindset of the author at the time they were doing it? Yeah, um, like if you don't want to, if you don't want to go down the entire list of uh, enumerating all the threats, Right. You can say, well, you know, as, um, you know, a, as a, uh, I don't know, just your, your Bluetooth example with the defibrillator, right? Um, as a, 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 you know, malicious user, I can um, capture that, um, you know, um, charging level for the defibrillator and change it and rebroadcast the signal at a stronger thing. So that way, when people are walking by, you know, they're going to get the wrong reading type of thing, right? That would be an abuse case because the spoofing, lack of authentication- Spoofing, the, spoofing the beacon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, tech, you know, you know kind of crosses a line between documenting formal threats. I mean, a formal threat is a little bit more structured in my mind. And abuse case is just 
words to me, right? Um, well, could we, could we do it with CWE? What do you mean? Use CW, use the weakness as the abuse case? Yeah, and just basically, like in his case, you say spoofing, okay? All right, well, there's the abuse case. That's the vulnerability. It would be somebody could spoof this. I just referenced the CWE for it instead. Maybe. But it doesn't give you the context of, well, how can you spoof it? You know, it doesn't do that. But 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 how is that different from a threat? Surely you could just state the abuse case as if it was a threat to the system. Yeah, in my mind, uh, a threat is a little bit more structured type of data. Um, you know, you're going to have a, you know, the threat, you're going to have potentially the severity or criticality, right, mm -hmm. of that threat. Um, you got to have a bunch of other data around it um, that might also, just like Urias Risk does, right, you map it to various weaknesses. Those weaknesses could, in fact, be CWEs, but it's a little bit more structured type of object versus an abuse case which is just a text view in my mind so i i think that we are veering into the domain of uh, threat elicitation abuse cases are one more way to get people started on finding threats right they're not threats by themselves they are something bad that you don't want to 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 happen now let's see what we have to do to avoid these things from happening so i i think that it's important for us to make a distinction between a threat and a finding a finding is something that we have identified as a threat. It has some correlation to CWE, to attack, to any of the frameworks, right? It has a criticality. It possibly has a priority. It's linked to a specific asset or element or process or something. So you know that if that thing happens, it hits this piece of the, the system and probably how bad it's going to be if it hits. So I, I think that the the object that we're talking about now is a finding, rather than a threat. Interesting. Okay. Which all contains right. the threat, but contains also all the meta information on how bad it is, what you do about it, where you found it, and all that good stuff. Got it. So the threat, if I'm looking at an object model, right, the threat would contain essentially what could potentially go wrong textually wise. And then it went underneath that, it would contain the finding, very specific information, right? The criticality, the CWEs, all the other stuff that kind of you would, you would want to capture. So being extremely biased, because that's how we represent it in uh, PyTM, mm -hmm. we created the finding element and a finding has both the textual and the criticality and the, the references in it. Right, so a threat, a threat gets included into a finding, and a finding is what we export in the report saying, hey, here's something that we found as a threat. Got it. So I guess I have to ask, and this speaks exactly to what Izar is talking about, what are we trying to do with this threat modeling, Bob? Are we trying to create a standard to move a model from one tool to another tool? you know, from Eardress Risk to Threat Dragon or something. I mean, is that what we're trying to do? Or are we trying to have a model that anybody can look at and understand what our thought process is and what we did? Those are two different things. And, and I think so, Izar is right. We don't need use cases and abuse cases if so we're I, just using this as an interchange format. I, I think this whole effort started because we wanted to look at OTM which started the way that I understand it as an interchange format between different tools. Mm -hmm. But then we saw that we could put more functionality on top of it by integrating it into the whole uh, uh, landscape of all the different bombs. We could get inform give information to other systems and get information from other systems. right? And, and this way we would live in this, this big uh, uh, ecosystem of bombs. Now, in my head, at the end of the day, two things happen. Either we, not either, we would end up with a TM bomb that is rich enough to enable these interactions between the different parts of the ecosystems and the tools that use them. 
and we would have something like if I'm new to the to the activity to the domain and I'm trying to automate it, I use one of the entry level tools like PyTM, Threat Dragon, others. Those create TM bombs. That that's their save format. Bigger, better tools, not better, bigger, deeper tools down the, the timeline are able to import those initial things and build on top of them so that the user, as they go over their uh, uh, evolution in the domain, don't have to redo work. They only need to get that thing that they started with and simply move to a different tool that will hopefully give them even more functionality or, or advantages. That, that, does that make sense? Figuring out what's required and what's optional is going to be really important for us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, and the XY was my example for why OTM doesn't today fulfill that capability. Another one, for example, is OTM is built on the, the CIA triad. And I think that nowadays it's important for us to, to put the P of privacy in there as well so that you don't have the triad, you have the, the, the whatever, the four things, right? And, oh, and OTM oh. wasn't ready to do that. Sorry, go ahead, Chris. No, no, I was just going to say that's striped. That's striped with P. It's striped. <laughs> it's it's a, a methodology that addresses it, yeah. but there is a whole bunch of. You could go yeah. to Lindo and you could go to True. a number of yeah. other things, right? But at yeah. the end of the day, when you are expressing that threat, it's nice if you could put privacy in there as one of the things that gets hit. And well, OTM and we, today we... didn't go there and that doesn't seem to be an evolution to OTM that's going to add that. Another and thing I, th that I, I think to... you know there are there are going to be aspects that will. Um, when we were, we were talking to um, automotive uh, vendors and they've got safety aspects and Chris maybe you have this in exactly. the medical field as well, you know they they don't care about the security of the data they care about the the safety of 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 the, the vehicle or, or the device itself so privacy might be one safety might be one i i, I if possible i think it'll be useful to be almost independent of the characteristics that you want to measure so that all of those things just end up being metadata and you can decide yep. well you know for us privacy we only care about privacy for this particular threat model don't care about any of the other stuff and so we only want to record data for privacy very, very, very true, Stephen. And, and even more interesting is in my industry, the two players are the manufacturers and the consumers, which are the HGOs, the health delivery organizations, hospitals, clinics, doctors' offices, right? And we don't share a common viewpoint on that CIA triad of importance, okay? Manufacturers view it one way and the end users view it a, a priority completely different. So as we're doing this, if we want to exchange this, any sort of threat model we would create as manufacturers it's going to have no value whatsoever to our end users because they're looking at it with a completely different priority basis. So if you can set those attributes, all right, of whatever they are, and then assign the relative priorities to them in your threat model, I think that that has real value. And, and Christopher, you, you just raised a, a point that I think that it's super important, this thing of manufacturers and consumers. Adam has for years champion the fact that threat models should be public. On the other hand, people with threat models, somewhat understandably, are uh, reticent to do that. They don't want to publish the whole threat model. Some people call them uh, roadmaps for attackers. It would be great if we had a format that at the end of the day, we can use some kind of tool to create just that piece of public information that we feel good with publishing, right? And, and have that thing almost like a, a, a VAT, I don't know, a secondary format that says, hey, these is the things that I worried about in my threat model. Yeah, the lawyers are never going to let that happen. <laughs> the what? <laughs> the lawyers are never going to let that happen. <laughs> it depends. It depends. If, 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 you know, if, if we manage to, to tell people, hey, you worried about these things, Here's digital proof that, yes, we are as well. And that digital proof could be, I don't know, some kind of just shooting into the wind, 
some crypto thing sign that whatever translates to a bunch of assertions or whatnot. People have gotten away with less than that. Well, in, and, in medical, we now have a huge amount of things, topics we have to include in the user manual, the instructions for use, the IFU. And a lot of that are things like very much, here's your topology, here's how we do authentication between everything, here's how we do encryption, here's how we do integrity mm -hmm. checking. We're showing all of that. So we're right. showing the mitigations, but we're not showing the entire set of potential threats. I mean, for, for years, uh, uh, systems have come out of hardening guides, right? Mm -hmm. If we could have something that relates between the threats we identified and the hardening guide and creates sort of a loop saying, hey, these are the things that we identified. These are the things that we are asking you to do in your configuration to make those things go away. And have you, yeah, have you ever noticed that we spent a lot of time on vulnerabilities and threats and nobody's ever enumerated mitigations? Hardening hardening stags are about as close as we've come to that. And those really aren't. I, I think that there's a reason for that. I think that it's very easy to point out that what could go wrong and it's not so easy to take an authoritative position on the things that are going to stop that from going wrong. Because if it ends up going wrong, somebody's going to come back to you and say, ah, you didn't give me that specific mitigation. And then what do you do? Nobody wants that liability on their heads, right? So it's easy to just say I... this could go wrong. Could be, could be. Okay, so I, I captured that uh, we must support security, privacy, and safety. Thank you, Stephen. I was actually going to bring up the safety aspects. Um, we don't want to be confined by the CIA triad. Uh, threats identified uh, based on missing requirements, and it would be nice to be able to link to those requirements to have justification. Um, well, that's that's excellent. Um, the must. Do we agree here that being able to define um, I, I assume this is a finding or threat, right? Is this is a is this is a security, privacy, or safety concern? Are we in agreement that that's going to be a requirement? So uh, let me add just something to think about here. Um, if you have if you have data like that, this threat impacts confidentiality and or integrity and or availability and or privacy, and you have those things kind of hard as hard coded part of the spec, it does give you ability to do some other things. So it, it so for example, you could then find that in an SBOM, there is a vulnerability that you know affects, allows an attacker to get access to data, but not change it, or it can read data, but you can't change the data. So you can now tie those two things together and say, my threat was against the confidentiality of data, and I was concerned about confidentiality specifically, and that vulnerability exposes uh, confidentiality, can expose uh, data to confidentiality attacks. Therefore, those two things are related. This is important, and I should pay attention to it. If you didn't have confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and privacy, and safety as hard-coded elements, and you just said, well, you can define whatever elements you like, and it's all just metadata, then it's going to be more difficult for the tooling to make those correlations and then say, well, actually, confidentiality is a thing I care about and know about, and I can extract it from a, an SBOM data, and I can correlate it with something in a, 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 a TM bomb. Now, for confidentiality, I mean, um, if if you have like a a threat on confidentiality, that obviously uh, can affect all three of these things, right? It can be a safety issue, depending on the type of data. It could be a privacy or security issue, obviously. Um, the the. The question in my mind is, is are these things, do we do we say that these five specific aspects, confidentiality, integrity, availability, privacy, and safety are five specific attributes, or do we say you as the TM bomb user can define whatever attributes you like 
and you just need to define them as string fields and give them names. I, I would I think much both. rather have an enumeration. I think both. I think those should be the common mandatory ones across everything. And then you have an extension that's definable because there are things there that are not being covered. Let me give you an example. Confidentiality, we think in terms of mass exposure of data, but what if you're only exposing keys that's a universal key across all of your products? You shouldn't do that, but it happens, all right? And suddenly you, you lose this. So an attack on one, this is now a chained attack. I attack mm -hmm. one thing and I extract that information, which by confidentiality, you can easily ignore because it's only one thing, but now I'm gonna use it as a secondary attack. How do I represent that? And that's always been a problem. It's like we're ignoring this and thinking in terms of these as automata, not as a chained environment. And, th and if you look at real attacks, frequently they use chain vulnerabilities in real attacks. Um, two, one, two, and three are like, one and two are almost the identical in occurrence and three drops off by a few percent. But it's very, very similar. So that's something that would we want everybody to do it? No but it should be out there as an extension capability. Well, I think it should be, I actually think it's kind of a foundational thing that we probably need to support because if you look at like Linden, right? They've got, I mean, we could have like multiple confidentiality issues, but it really becomes a privacy issue once you can actually start building a, you know, report essentially on an individual, right? All these little discrete pieces of data suddenly now tell you a lot about a person, uh, which is one of the types of threats that I can't remember what they call it, but um, you know that those multiple confidentiality issues ultimately become like a privacy issue. Mm -hmm. We run into it all the time. Again, you're doing Bluetooth, low energy, and it's all encrypted app level over the air encrypted. You've got all this stuff going across there, but you've got a BD address, basically a MAC address, that is in clear text that's being transmitted. And that goes part and partial with a G10 back to the manufacturer. So if you see somebody walking through a pharmacy and then you pull up this Bluetooth advertising and go, oh, that's Medtronic, kick out a, a coupon for insulin uh, supplies for these people because you know, you know what they are. You can extract from this metadata that's associated with this and pull out great deals of information. That's pure privacy. So are we saying then uh, that we want to basically support CIA with the privacy and safety extensions, or do we want to be generic and just say security, privacy, safety? Do we want both? Do we want something to be extensible? Look, at the end of the day, there is no getting away from the fact that most of the industry is interested in at least those five things, right? So yeah. start with the five, make it extensible. People can enrich that thing any way they want. Some will say, hey, you know what? Whatever hit on confidentiality, it's much more important to me the hit on safety. And they'll be able to, to do those, that, that kind of enrichment themselves. Or if somebody comes up with something that's important to them that I can't even think about at this time, so just create a field for that as an extension of the impact fields and just have it. But we start with those five. That, that's what mostly everybody is, is interested in. Okay, got it. So, so let, let I capture me, this correctly? Let me play devil's advocate. Yeah, I think so. Let me play devil's advocate here with safety because I think safety, and I'm going to channel these are here. I think it's a derived attribute, okay? Um, and if you're looking at this, how is safety not going to be captured? Usually it's a function of integrity, right? Because you've now altered the operation of the system in some way. Right? So how is safety different than integrity or availability, actually? Uh, suddenly, I, suddenly you're not breathing for the patient. I'm, this I'm goes going down to, be, to the use to, cases, I think. And I'm going to be very obtuse here. It sounds very close to saying that privacy is derived from confidentiality which is not. No, it's not. It's not. I, I, yeah, I, I would say it's not. So but I safety think... for me, be, being able to send a packet to an application that eventually makes it into the CAN bus and turns off the engine while a car is in the, the road, I find it very torturing to put that as an integrity problem. 
Okay. Good, good example. Okay. I'll take that. Now, I, if you maybe, take, maybe, for example, like self-driving cars as an example, right? Um, the software in self-driving cars will always favor the driver. Always. And if that means like running over a bunch of school kids, that's basically what the car is going to do in, an, in, an, in a no-win situation. That's a known threat. Insurance companies know about this. Um, is it a confidentiality, integrity, or availability issue? No. It's working as design. Oh, lovely. We just called the, the, the trolley. Oh. <laughs> the but trolley it is a safety problem. issue. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Good. Thanks. Interesting way to think about it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I've got a hard stop on the hour. Yeah. Same. Thank you. Good discussions, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thank All you. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.